guys, so it's Elizabeth back again. I am a labor and delivery nurse and certified childbirth educator and nurse Zabe here on YouTube and on Instagram if you want to follow me over there. A little shout out. Um, and I am going to be doing a very highly requested video, 10 things that your labor nurse wants you to know about induction. There's a lot of information out there about induction and this is just hopefully going to be another piece of information and education for you guys. Um, this is not the be all end all. Obviously different hospitals, different countries um, have different policies and procedures. So it's important that you use this video as a starting point for a conversation with your doctor or your midwife when you are deciding to schedule an induction or being scheduled for a medical induction. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So the first thing that your labor and delivery nurse wants you to know about induction is, what is an induction? Oh, what is an induction you might ask? So an induction is when we, your labor and delivery providers, stimulate labor contractions and cervical change on a person who was not in labor. So an induction can be elective, which means that you're choosing to do it, or medical, meaning that your doctor is encouraging you to do it because there could be something wrong. Um, and I'm gonna go into all this a little bit more detail too. Um, it can be done by manual induction methods or uh, like medications for induction. And often it's a combination of those two that are done for the induction. So the second thing your labor nurse wants you to know about induction is that there are two different types. Like I mentioned before, we have elective and we have medical. Normally what we do uh, with we, when we have a mother who is uh, about to have a baby is called expectant management where we wait until they go into labor. But sometimes when we're doing expectant management and we are watching moms and babies for any symptoms that things aren't going exactly as we have planned, um, if there's some issues with mom or with baby's health, then your doctor might want to schedule a medical induction. And a medical induction is one that is being done because there is some sort of issue with mom or baby's health. I'm gonna name a few just off the top of my head that I can think of. So for mama, it might be that she has uh, preeclampsia um, or gestational hypertension, and videos are coming on those soon, that we know that she has some disease or disorder that could affect baby, like gestational diabetes or, or colitis stasis. It might also be because baby, for whatever reason, um, is has some sort of intrauterine growth restriction. Uh, if there is too much or too little fluid for baby, um, it could be because we know that mom has a history of shoulder dystocia in the past, so we're trying to have a baby a little bit earlier so that baby is born a little bit smaller than its siblings to decrease that risk of shoulder dystocia. It might also uh, be because mom is of advanced maternal age is actually a reason for medical induction. Medical inductions can happen before 39 weeks, uh, depending on what's going on. Um, but elective induction, where there is no medical reason for the induction, but perhaps you live really far away from the hospital and your first birth was really short, you don't wanna have your baby in the car, your husband is about to be deployed and you want him to be home for the delivery. Um, reasons that aren't medically indicated, but can be um, indicated based on what's happening in your life would be reasons for an elective induction. And we are not allowed to do elective inductions before 39 weeks because 39 weeks is considered full term. And even babies who are born between 36 and 38 weeks can do great and not need any NICU time. They also, if we are telling the body to go into labor with our induction methods versus the body going into labor naturally because the baby has told it to go into labor, then we have an increased risk of baby having issues, uh, particularly respiratory issues and issues with their blood sugar and issues with being jaundiced if they are what we term late preterm. So an elective induction is not going to happen until 39 weeks. Recently, there was a study that came out that said women being induced at 39 weeks with their first baby are less likely to have a C-section than women who um, are expectantly managed. So we just kind of wait for them to go into labor with their first baby. 
I personally would like to see a little bit more research before we make a change in um, how we manage all first time moms at 39 weeks, just inducing everybody straight out the bat um, because I'm a big fan of mother nature and I think that in general that she knows what she's doing. But I will say as far as a medical induction, like yes, in general, mother nature does know what she is doing. She does, but mother nature is kind of like meh. If, if you don't make it, meh. But like, we care if, if you don't make it because that is your baby and that is you, like the mom. Like, no, that is not okay. Um, so in general, the elective induction at 39 weeks thing, you know what, if it works for you, if that's what you and your doctor decide, I think that's a great plan. But if you decide you wanna do expected management still, even with that study, I also think that's a great plan. Um, so yeah, so now we've gone over what an induction is, the two different types of inductions. Number three is going to be, how do we do an induction? So, to do an induction, the there are a few different things that we can do. And often we do more than one of these things. Sometimes we end up doing all of them. So there are two different ways that we kind of can get an induction started. We can use medication or we can use um, a manual form of dilation. Sometimes we use both of them together. So manually, um, sometimes at the start of an induction, you will get your membrane swept. This is when the doctor with sterile gloved fingers goes inside your cervix and separates your amniotic sac from where it's adhered right around your cervix. Their goal is not to break your water, but it is to do this kind of aggressive membrane sweep um, to release prostaglandins, which will make you hopefully naturally have some contractions. And if labor is going to come, um, it definitely can help hurry that process along. So not all doctors will do membrane sweeps as part of their induction process. Some will. Um, with membrane sweeps, the biggest risk is that um, they can rupture your membranes prematurely and ruptured membranes without labor just puts a little bit of a clock on, on what we're doing. Some doctors will not do a membrane sweep on you if you are group B strep positive. Um, some will, so it just kind of depends, but it is something that is definitely uncomfortable, but May is singing to herself in quiet time. It's something that's definitely uncomfortable, but labor is uncomfortable too um and it's something that you can request at one of your later prenatal appointments if you're getting closer to your due date and you are hoping that that might kind of swing you into labor i had it done with may um i had some light spotting from it lost a little bit of mucus plug a few little contractions and then my water broke like within 48 hours after that so uh, it didn't really swing me into labor but it got enough brewing to break my water and then i needed pitocin which not not my favorite thing. I'm not sure that I would get my membrane swept again, but it is an option and sometimes something that will be incorporated in as a manual form of getting things started with an induction. Um, another kind of more broadly used way of manual dilation is with a Foley balloon. And that is when we've got your cervix again. So your cervix has to be a little bit dilated for this to get in. Um, they're going to put in a Foley catheter, which is what they put in your bladder. When you're unable to pee, like when you have an epidural, um, they put that in and they, when it's in your bladder, they fill the balloon up with saline and that holds that balloon there. So when we're doing it for labor induction, we put it up into your cervix and fill the balloon up so that it's putting pressure on kind of all sides of your cervix to make your cervix go away. Sometimes this is enough to get labor started, but sometimes um, the Foley bulb will fall out around four or five centimeters dilated. You're not still not in, in active labor, even though you've made that, that dilation, we still need baby to come down and the contractions to open the cervix the rest of the way. Um, sometimes the Foley bulb is used in conjunction with Pitocin at the same time um for dilation so i've heard kind of both things that people say that the foley bulb is super uncomfortable i've heard people say that it's not uncomfortable i personally have not had it placed um but it can be fairly effective in getting things started and sometimes your body will take over from there and sometimes we need some other medications to finish things up hey y'all so it's future 
editing Elizabeth here, I had texted my sister-in-law about um, her induction because she actually was just induced like a week ago today uh, by the Foley bulb and the Pitocin method, and I wanted to get her take on it. So I'm going to read you the text that she sent me back. If you've ever had an IUD put in, it feels very similar. Uncomfortable pressure and some pain slash discomfort for a few minutes. Once it's in, there's only a little bit of pressure. I thought the most annoying thing was the line that's sticking out and taped to your leg. And that is something that I didn't mention is that with a Foley bulb, you're going to actually have the end of the, the Foley uh, catheter is going to be taped to your leg to apply some tension to apply more pressure to your cervix. Moving on from the manual dilation side of things, um, there are a few different medications that can be used for dilation. So at my hospital, um, for cervical ripening um, and for kind of getting things started with an induction, especially one that's not super dilated, if there's still some thickness to the cervix, we use something called Cytotec or Mesoprostol. And that is a prostaglandin that um, helps ripen the cervix, helps get it nice and soft and moving on. Some people, all they need is a, a dose of Cytotec and things get going. These are typically people who've had babies prior. Um, some people, we use the Cytotec for a few doses to soften the cervix, and then we will either break their water or do some Pitocin to kind of keep things moving. Another medication that is similar to Cytotec um, is Cervidil, and Cervidil is kind of it's the medication and it's on like almost like a tampon like thing that you can insert uh, and then you can take it out which is nice because the Cytotec is like a little pill um, and the kind of the big risk or issue with that one is once it goes in you can't really get it out it's either a half or fourth of a pill we give 25 to 50 um, micrograms um, inserted vaginally um, you also can take it orally if your water is broken um, or have it kind of dissolve under your tongue or in your cheek depending on the medication that they choose to give you and the Cytotec actually is not a medication that is FDA approved for labor, labor induction. It's been used for a really, really long time though, and it's been studied, but it's not FDA approved because there's a lot of money that goes into getting something FDA approved, and the dosage that we use in labor and delivery is so small. Um, basically, there would be no return on the investment is how I have heard it explained by our doctors. The Cervidil is FDA approved, um, but normally facilities will have one or the other. Another thing that they might do for an induction, and you might start off with this medication or it might be something that's brought in later on to increase the frequency and the strength of your contractions is Pitocin. So Pitocin is a synthetic form of oxytocin. It is a love bonding hormone and it is also the hormone that um, makes us have contractions, which kind of sucks, but you know, have to get the baby out somehow. Um, Pitocin is a high alert medication, so it is always run on a pump and it is titrated so that we can get your contractions every two to three minutes lasting 60 to 90 seconds and make sure that baby is tolerating contractions appropriately um every hospital is a little bit different but you're going to start off on a pretty low dose of pitocin and then every some hospitals it's 20 some hospitals it's 30 minutes at our hospital you start off on two milli units of pitocin which is two mls an hour so basically like i'm just like spitting just a teeny tiny little teeny tiny bit of pitocin at you um, we're going to go take that Pitocin, we're going to watch your contractions and be watching baby. Um, you will be continuously monitored if you are on the Pitocin and we will go up every 30 minutes by 2 milli units until we get that contraction pattern that we're looking for. So often, um, depending on where your cervix is, you might start with the Cytotec or the Cervidil or start with a Foley bulb and then if we need a little bit more oomph to those contractions later on in your induction process, we'll add the uh, Pitocin. So with the Pitocin, unlike when your body is naturally making it, um, the synthetic form sometimes can um, use up all of the receptors and you might be on the highest dose of Pitocin that your facility allows or that the physician is comfortable with you being on and even so, you are not changing your cervix and you, maybe you're not even really that uncomfortable with the Pitocin. So one thing we can do then is called a Pitocin break where we shut off the Pitocin for a certain amount of time, typically a few hours, really let all of those receptors get rid of the Pitocin that's on them and be open back up to take more Pitocin on when we restart the Pitocin. Um, 
and sometimes that can be really effective in getting things moving if we've kind of overloaded your body with Pitocin and it's not really moving in the direction that we are hoping for, which is increased strength and frequency of contractions and increased cervical dilation. Another thing that they might add is breaking your water. This again um, changes the whole, basically having a baby is physics. So breaking your water changes the physics of having a baby. It means that the baby's head is going to be more directly applied on the cervix. It means that um, again those prostaglandins that are released when we do a membrane strip are going to be released as well and there's a little bit less cushion. For a lot of people breaking their water in an induction really amps up the game and gets things rolling and moving and gets us ready to have a baby which again is the whole point of an induction. It might depend on what medication you're taking, how many doses they like you to have before they break your water. But breaking your water can definitely be something that gets things really rampant up. Two doses of ampicillin um, is the medication that we give for group B strep before uh, her water is broken. Different hospitals might give different drugs. Now, that being said, there are risks with breaking your water just with everything. Um, so the doctor is going to assess the station of the baby, which is how high the baby is. Um, and they are not going to break your water if baby's very high because there is a risk of the cord slipping down in front of the baby's head, um, which would be called a cord prolapse, which would need an emergency section. So the doctor is going to be assessing that. Um, if your cervix is not very dilated and we're not doing very many contractions, we also don't want to break your water because we don't want your water to be broken for a really, really long period of time because when it's broken for a longer period of time, that increases your risk of infection and hello, we don't want mom or baby to get infected um, because one, people are sick and two, infected uteruses kind of suck. They're, you know, picture yourself with the flu. Do you want to do any work? Picture your uterus with the flu. Does it want to do any work? No. So um, infected uteruses, either they kind of go crazy trying to get the baby out or they just kind of like, they can't do it. They're not, they don't have the strength. And so we want to keep mom from getting infected. Um, also, if mom is group B strep positive, she will need to have gotten at our hospital. When we do an induction, there might be something that we need to do beforehand called a cervical ripening. And a cervical ripening is done if the cervix isn't ripe or it isn't ready for an induction. And how we figure out if the cervix is ripe or not is we assess the cervix. So is the cervix still really, really, really far back, kind of behind the baby's head or really back deep in the vagina? Has it come forward? Is the cervix soft or is it really, 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 really hard, okay? Is the cervix opened at all or is it still nice and closed? If the cervix is far back, it is closed, it is high, and we are doing a medical induction, meaning that medically we need you to have a baby for your health or for the health of your baby or for both of your health, then we can do something called a cervical ripening. And where I work with the cervical ripening, what we do is the night before, they will have you come in, they'll monitor the baby, they'll place a very small dose of a cervical ripening agent. Where I work, it is Cytotec, which is also mesoprostol. Some places will do Cervidil and then we continue to monitor the baby and then often we let you sleep. Some of our providers will send people home after a cervical ripening to come back the next morning for their induction. Some of our providers prefer that people stay in-house in case for some reason things kick up and they end up going into labor. So part of having induction, um, really, you want to have a cervix that is is ready, that it's it's ripe. And if it's not ripe, we do the cervical ripening like I talked about. But a score system that we kind of use to figure out is this a good time for an induction, particularly an elective induction, or if it's a medical induction, do we need to ripen beforehand, um, is called the Bishop score. And I'm going to read off all of the things. So there are five categories for a Bishop score that are scored from either zero to three. So a Bishop score generally of a six or an eight, it's a little bit um, debated there, or higher is a good time to do uh, induction, particularly an elective induction. If it's lower than that, we'll, then we might need to do some cervical ripening before we move to our induction. Um, so here are the things that make up a Bishop score. Relation of the cervix, and that's gonna be closed, would be a zero, 
one to two would be a one, three to four is a two, or five to six is a three. My goodness. And yes, some women really do walk around at five to six centimeters dilated. Position of the cervix, so posterior, is it really, really far back? Mid position or anterior? Um, and for that one, you can't get a three. Effacement, zero to 30, 40 to 50, 60 to 70, or 80 plus. Station, minus three, so baby is up in China. Um, minus two, um, minus one to zero, or plus one to plus two, um, and cervical consistency, are we firm, medium, or soft? So looking at all of those things together, um, you get a, a score, a, a bishop score, and a lot of doctors might not formally write down a bishop score, but they're kind of doing that math in their head. Okay, where are we at? Do we need to do a little bit of ripening before our induction? Should we wait on an elective induction because it probably won't be successful? Um, and here's the thing with elective inductions. Sometimes you come in for your elective induction, things aren't really moving, um, and if your water isn't broken, you might go home and come back and try again. Because it wasn't working, and we don't want to box ourselves into a corner where the labor is not progressing, and we've broken your water, and we have committed to having a baby, and you end up needing a C-section because your labor's not progressing because your body was not ready yet to have a baby. So sometimes with elective inductions, um, we send you home. Does not happen very often. It's obviously a conversation the doctor will have with you. Do you want to continue or would you like to go home and try again in a few days? But that can definitely be something that happens. Um, and I have seen it happen and I have seen those moms come back for an induction a little while later and have a successful vaginal delivery. So sometimes patients really does wonder. Mm -hmm.